Okay. Right. So this is the first part of my presentation. So what you call the tutorial. Um, I'll talk about what we have done on cell mimics, um, developing cell mimics to study active movements and deformations um, um, produced by the actin uh, cytoskeleton and um, the dynamic actin cytoskeleton. So I'm happy to share with you that we are now with Julie Plastino at Ecole Normale Supérieure. It's just across the street, but it's a new place um, and uh, with wonderful uh, physicists. Right, so, um, oops. So I um, suggest to have two parts. So one is more an introductory part on cell motility and the cytoskeleton. And the other one is what we have done. I mean, two uh, main things that I would like to present today about passive deformation oppositely to active deformation. Um, and what we can um, learn from that. Uh, so I, I'd like to start with um, the fact that motility is just, I mean, motility uh, of, of small cells is just a matter of filaments and motors. And you know these sperm cells um, with a flagellum that beats and is able to propel this forward. And you know these movies about, about a neutrophil that is chasing um, work. So anyway, um, never mind. It, does, it, does, it doesn't seem to work. But this neutral field is able to move by assembly of filaments and motors inside inside the cell. So this is just something that sticks to the substrate. But in fact, what one, what I want to say is that it, whether you have a flagellum or whether you, you need to organize yourself to have your, your motility mechanism inside the cell, you need filaments and motors. And it's just a, a question of different organizations. So on, on the left, um, this is sperm cells with or bacteria with a flagellum. And on the right, you have a crawling, what's called crawling um, um, to uh, oppositely to swimming. But it's just a matter of vocabulary. Um, so, um, in fact, this goes back very um, a long time ago in evolution. So our ancestors were swimming cells, and when eukaryotes appear, appeared, there, there were these cells with a nucleus inside, which are eukaryotes, and, and with a flagellum. But when these cells had to assemble to make uh, an organism, then all these flagella and motors needed to get inside and get organized in such a way that the cell could still move um, even within an organism. So what is um, cell motility? So this was understood by Abercrombie um, um, a while ago when even before we had all these very nice imaging um, capacities, but in fact, um, so he was the one uh, describing cell movement, so crawling cell, crawling cells um, uh, in three steps. So, um, so imagine you have a cell on a substrate. So it's the same. I mean, it's slightly different in the cell for a cell in an organism. But a cell on a substrate, you have so some adhesion of the cell to the substrate that could be the extracellular matrix. But let's look um, in the laboratory. Um, so you you have a you have a, um, a, a cover slip here. You put your living cell on top of it, and what you will see that it will move in three steps. So one will be what's called actin polymerization underneath the membrane. So step one is that this actin dynamics is able to push the membrane forward. The second step is the development of new of new adhesions so that this new newly deformed membrane can, can stick to the substrate. And the third one is retraction of the uh, back of the cell. And in fact, if you look at how, um, if you look at how these uh, actin filaments are organized here, you find this organization, 
So you see um, a branched active network that is able to push the membrane forward. So here the membrane has been uh, removed. It's the interior of the cell. And you, I mean, the question is, how is that possible that the branch network can push the membrane forward? If you look at the, the um, cytoskeleton at the, at, the, at the back of the cell here, it's, it's the same style of organization with actin filaments here that are able to, to be put under tension by molecular motors that are represented in red here. So the actin filaments are in green, the molecular motors are in red, and here, this can contract, whereas here it's the simple actin polymerization of the filaments at the front that is able to push it forward. But we have worked extensively on actin polymerization, and the interesting thing is that this actin polymerization mechanism, so the fact that actin filaments can grow and push an object, this is found inside cells. So these are endosomes inside cells that are pushed by this, what has been called comet, actin comet, made of filaments that are able to deform the, the shape of this object here, or being hollow here. Um, I, I won't have time to go into these details, but it's the same mechanism that pushes the membrane forward, that pushes objects inside the cells. So we want to understand how it works. So in fact, the cell is a much more complicated uh, Thing. And um, in fact, um, if you look at the cell, you have actin filaments all over the place. Um, this is a cell that is uh, moving towards this direction. So you have philopodia that are uh, parallel filaments um, attached to the membranes that, that grow. So here in yellow, you have the new actin monomers that are inserted between the membrane and the actin, or branch filaments that are able to push the membrane or tethers that are able to attach the, actin, the growing actin filament to the membrane. Here you have motors, here you have um, sort of arches that are put under tension by motors sliding on the actin filaments. Um, and here you have motors um, uh, contracting the actin network and, and attached to the, to the membrane. And the difficulty is that um, all that is active, all that con consumes ATP, it constantly moves, it constantly uh, polymerizes, contracts, um, uh, and, and then we need to understand how this works. And we have dash pots and springs, but we have also some activity here that we want to understand. Right, so how do we, how do we try to understand that it's uh, we're uh, reconstituted systems? And I will show you here a sort of gallery of um, some, some of the approaches we have uh, developed. But the, the main idea is that we have here an object, either a bead, a droplet, or a liposome, on, on top of which we, we reproduce the polymerization of actin filaments. So here we have an activator of, of actin uh, filament growth, uh, actin network growth. And, and it, it's able to grow at the membrane. So proteins are not to scale here. I think this is very big here because we spent sort of three years working on that. And the rest just is, um, uh, I mean, works by itself. So then we can add some ingredients here. So all these filaments grow um, as a function of time. And then we, we can add some what's called capping proteins that will prevent the, the filaments from growing. And we can add, add molecular motors. So what we see is that we're able to reduce the deformation of membranes. We can see what, what we have called symmetry breaking. So here we have a network that grows around the bead and after a while it's under pressure and it breaks open. It can also propel these beads inside, inside um, the, the liquid. And we can have some, some peculiar motion here with a um, noid droplet where um, um, uh, so actin filaments, uh, actin network growth is able to deform this oil droplet uh, during its movement and with the saltatory motion. And um, if we add the molecular motors, then we were able to produce this contraction at the rear of the cell, as you can see here. Right, so in fact, what's known about the molecular um, assembly that goes there 
like this is a, 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 a huge work of understanding of how these proteins work. But the principle is that you have this branched actin filament. So um, let's start from the left here. So you have an activator that will activate a complex. And this complex will, will bind to the size of a, of a, of a to the side of a filament and be able to, to grow a new branch. And so this mechanism will be um, sort of uh, complexified or simplified by uh, the addition of molecules that will allow to cut the old filaments into pieces so that they can um, uh, regenerate and, and come back again in, in its um, ATP form. So here, uh, um, actin is uh, in its, um, let's say, old shape, I mean, like ADP form, and then it's able to regenerate into ATP form so that it can polymerize again. And so one other thing is that to avoid this exponential growth to, to to go forever, ever, there are capping proteins that are able to terminate the elongation of the actin filaments. So in fact, for a while, so this is sort of biochemistry, how the biochemistry works in solution. But for a while, we, we didn't know how it worked at the membrane. So how can a filament push and pu push and elongate. You see there is an obstacle. So how can it uh, both push and, and, and detach and elongate? So there was a, a work by the group of uh, Laurent Blanchot in Grenoble that was, I think, very enlightening. So what they did was they, used, they took an activated fiber that you see here. So uh, here um, behind this, you, you, there's a, a fiber where you put the activator of actin polarization and you look at the function of time, what happens? So you see, because it's, a, it's activated, it's able to polymerize actin. So you see a new filament that is growing here. It's the uh, red arrowhead. And then it's able, one, once this new filament touches the activated fiber, it's able to create a new branch. This is the yellow arrowhead. And so this filament will continue. It's a free. It's free. You see, it's sort of it's attached here to to the uh, to the activated fiber, but it's fluctuating. So it's a flexi semi flexible filament that is able to fluctuate. And then when this filament um, 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 touches again the activated fiber, it can make a new branch here, and etc. 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 Every time filaments touch this activated fiber, they make a new branch. So um, in fact, the, the way uh, we understood it in a sort of mesoscopic, at a mesoscopic scale is that you grow, you form new branches at the surface, at the activated surface, and then you have these proteins that are able to finish the growth, the growth of the filaments. And then you create a sort of active zone next to the surface um, whether it's a fiber, a one-dimensional surface, or a two-dimensional surface, or a more, more complex surface. And then this polymerization is able to push this dead, dead zone away um, to, to add some more material um, at, the, at the surface here. Right, so now what happens uh, within this network? So this is um, a simulation work done by um, the group of Martin Lenz. So the principle is that you have your filaments here, your branch filaments that have grown here from the basal surface. So you make them grow and then you pull, pull on it. So you see that if you pull on something dense, you will generate within the network some uh, stresses on the filaments. If you do the same on a less dense network, when you will push, you will accumulate no stress inside this. So in fact, this is this sort of stress accumulation uh, in a dense network, in a dense branch network. This is something you can visualize by making this experiment here. So you take a bead, a spherical bead here, it's a bead of uh, 15 micrometer diameter. And then you add, um, um, your, I mean, you activate the surface of these beads, so the monomers are um, 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 
and they polymerize at the surface of this bead. So you generate one first layer of, of network. And then you continue the experiment and then you insert new, like, new monomers in between this bead and the already grown uh, network. Then you put the first layer under tension really. And if you continue, et cetera, and et cetera, the first layer will be under tension. Whereas the new layer here at the surface of the bead won't be under tension. And so the, the result here is that because the tangential stress will be the highest here at the surface of the first layer, then this, this is where it will break because the, the stress will increase with time. And this is what we see in this symmetry breaking um, experiment. So you see that as a function of time. And so the next step is that these beads move at a velocity of about a few micrometers per minute. Um, just like the endosomes I was uh, showing you at the, at the beginning of this talk, or like cells. Right, so um, I have two parts, but um, I'll, I'll need to go quite fast. Um, uh, so I would like to insist on, on the difference between passive and active deformations um, um, in of the actin cytoskeleton, but let's let's say we will we'll, we'll do on the only the passive part. So what we do is uh, we take our experimental system with a membrane, uh, the activator of actin polymerization. Here we add the capping protein, so we we stick our activator to uh, biotin links um, uh, that are to biotins that are linked to the membrane. And what we do is we grow. We first grow the actin network. Then we stop the reaction. In fact, uh, the way we stop the reaction is we dilute the sample. So there is no ATP anymore, no active monomer. So we, we, we grow this network. Then we, we stop the growth. And then we deflate this membrane. So we make uh, water leave the membrane. And so to understand what, what will happen, you need to know that, um, in fact, this branch network, if I if I make a drawing of roughly of how it is, it's it's a sort of uh, network with a mesh size of about um, 30 to 50 nanometers, whereas the lipid head is, is much, much smaller. It's um, on the order of angstrom, angstroms. So we have here, imagine we have a sort of, um, a flat membrane underneath this um, network that is deformable, uh, sort of um, its shape can, can vary, whereas we have this net this, um, that we want to understand the properties of. So the, what we did was, um, so do these experiments. So we, again, we grow the actin network, then we stop the reaction, and then just by an osmotic shock, we make water leave the inside, we deflate these objects. And what we see is that, so we have two cases, either we see this uh, buckling, what we call buckling, um, so it's a, it has a shape of a donut, let's say, or we see what we call wrinkling. So you see, there is a big difference between these two. Here we have this buckling like a ping pong ball on which you would have pushed. And here we have wrinkling like, like my wrinkles around my eyes. So we measured uh, the frequency of deformed liposomes of buckling, buckled liposomes, um, um, oppos opposition of, or by opposition of wrinkled liposomes. And you see that at, at um, low thickness, so small thicknesses, we see more buckling. And at high thicknesses, thicknesses of this, of this network, so actin is in green, I didn't say, but actin is in green and membrane is in purple as it is, it is here. So we see a lot of buckling for thin shells and lots of wrinkling for thick shells. So the way we understand this is it's, it's sort of classical soft matter physics, is that, in fact, if we have thin actin shells, bending is dominant because all the elastic energy that is needed to deform this, I mean, to, to, to have the right shape, is here, where it's very bent. And this costs an energy 
that um, tells you that the curvature, the maximum curvature that you have here um, uh, depends on the um, deflation of the liposome, the thickness of the, of the network, and the radius of the, of the liposome. And then if we have thick actin shells, so it's a different story here, because if you have a thick actin shell and you deflate your liposomes, so the thick actin shell cannot deform like this one. So you will have some deformation within, within a length that is well known here, um, uh, that, is, that, that depends on the uh, elastic modulus of the network and the bending rigidity of the membrane. So this um, uh, wavelength is well known in, in many um, systems uh, with the uh, deformable um, sheet and, and a, a thick network, thick uh, elastic network that has a, an elastic modulus. So uh, we, um, we could estimate this. I mean, if we take um, the properties of our system, it's 350 nanometers. So we could, um, estimate that theoretically, I mean, with our estimates in the system. Um, and um, so I, I'll, I'll go quick on this. Um, and in fact, we could put our uh, results in a diagram here. This is the uh, thickness of the actin shell as a function of the radius of the, um, of the liposome. And what we can see, can see here from this transition between, between buckling and wrinkling, we could derive the um, thickness at which, the critical thickness at which we have this transition. And we find two micrometer that is a little higher than 350 nanometers that was planned, that was estimated. But in fact, here you remember that we have something that's pre-stressed. So you remember when I draw my network around a spherical bead, I have this stress. So this is before symmetry is broken. So I, I still have my system under stress and then I decrease this volume. So this is why um, this wavelength is slightly higher because uh, we have this uh, pre-stress in this system. Right, so I suggest I stop here um, by concluding that with our membrane actin systems, we can have, we can obtain this mechanism of buckle, buckling versus wrinkling. Um, that is a very general uh, soft matter um, behavior that is found in, in a lot of uh, living systems like uh, pollen grains or uh, the chicken gut. Uh, right, so I'll, I'll stop here. Um, and um, go to my um, take home messages that actin network growth um, exerts an active, uh, uh, an, an active, okay, sorry, that the grown actin network has clear elastic properties. So I, sh I didn't have time to, to talk about the, the first part, but in fact, the, the main take home message here is that this wrinkling and buckling um, just proves that the actin network, that um, the, the branch actin network has elastic properties because we can um, explain it. We, we can explain buckling and wrinkling by um, soft matter elastic um, um, uh, model. So I will stop here and, and thank all the people who did the work and the, um, the uh, collaborations um, that were great. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Cecily, for the talk. Um, so I haven't seen any question in the chat box. Anyone want to read? Oh, here's one. Um, Eric asks, any evidence of, of relaxation at longer time scales? Huh. With oh, right. Period. So we don't have access to, to that because then, um, oh, I see. So if we, you, you mean after the wrinkling? So, so in fact, no. We can, so this happens in 20 minutes. And if we look at the, at the um, liposomes and shells after hours, they are still there. So the answer is no at the um, day scale. Okay. 
So Diago asked questions, can you make an active network where you tune elastic and viscous, uh, viscous properties? All right, that's a very good question. Um, so in fact, um, certainly yes. But what I'm saying today is that the branched actin network are not very viscous. So we have tried to, so this was in the other part. So we have changed the uh, mesh size of, the net, of this network by changing the way we activate it. And we still see quite a lot of elasticity. Okay. I think the difference would be in the, in the growth uh, when they grow, we, we could see some viscosity arising when, when they, when, by growth, by, by active growth. You see what I mean? Okay. So, this is not passive viscosity. Mm -hmm. So the, the short answer is in principle we could, but I don't know how. Okay, probably let's uh, have the last question uh, before we move to the next section is, uh, um, Garima asks you, uh, what about if we have a stretch nozzle? How the mechanism of, uh, be different for thick and thin membranes? Oh, can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, so you can also find it in the chat box. So he, uh, she, uh, he asked, what about if we have a stretch nozzle? So how the, membrane, uh, how the mechanism be different for thick and thin membranes? A thin membrane? Okay, so. Thick and a thin membranes. Do they, uh, well, we see different mechanism? Uh, so maybe I should uh, look at the, which, uh, we have stretching also, or how the mechanism for thick and thin membranes. Um, so I think, um, um, so here it's the same network that is thin or thick, because I didn't say, but, to make thin networks, we just stop it earlier. So either we stop the reaction at five minutes or at 20 minutes. So it's the same network that is thin or thick. Um, now, if we have stretching, I guess the membrane with, will stretch. And um, uh, if we have stretching, um, so this is, I would say this is the opposite. You will have to inflate the liposomes. And I would predict that you would make symmetry break. Okay. And it would, well, would just explode. I mean, 